guys. I hope you are feeling alive right now. I'm Micah Keneally, and I want to welcome you to the second season yeah. of Young Adults Dot Today podcast, Ooh. where we talk about reaching young adults in our world today. And like every other time, I'm joined with my husband here, Pastor Josiah Keneally. And Josiah, we have an awesome guest to help kick off the new year. I know people have New Year's resolutions. They've been in the holiday season. I know I get really groggy then. I also want to watch some Hallmark movies and all those other things that can kind of pile up in, you know, December leading into January. But we have a wonderful guest today. And Josiah, would you mind introducing who that special person is? Yeah, we're really excited. Like Micah said, I'm really excited that to kick off a new year, a new season and a new decade, actually, we're happy 2020 listeners and everyone. Um, we're here joined today for this episode by Dr. Alicia Britt. Choli. And Dr. Choli has often been compared to a velvet wrapped sword, if you can picture that. Her voice is soothing and her messages are piercing at the same time. She's an award winning writer and the author of some amazing books Anonymous, The Sacred Slow, and 40 Days of Decrease. Alicia is also a skillful mentor and an international speaker, both men and women, learners and leaders across. All ethnicities uh, agree that in a culture obsessed with all things new, Alicia brings ancient truth back to life. And Alicia holds a doctorate in leadership and spiritual formation from George Fox Seminary and serves as the founding director and lead mentor of Leadership Investment Intensives, which you can check out online. It's a nonprofit devoted to providing customized soul care for leaders in both business and ministry, along with her husband, Dr. Barry J. Choli, and their three amazing children who are all Cholis through the miracle of adoption. Alicia and her family lives in the o Ozark countryside, and some of the things she enjoys are thunderstorms, jalapenos, Lord of the Rings, thorny questions, wild woods, and pianos in empty rooms. And really, I'm excited because when Micah and I have been praying, who could lead us into a new decade? Mm -hmm. Who could lead us into a new year of 2020? And who could, who could really kick off a strong start to a new season? We just decided that soul care was where God was leading us. And Alicia would be the guest that we would choose to invite. And she said, yes. <laughs> so we're really thankful. And I've read everything that she's written or published that I can find. And it's deeply impacted my soul and our lives. So thank you, Alicia, for being with us today. Well, thank y'all. It's a joy to be with you. <laughs> that was a big mouthful of information about you, but we are so <laughs> happy that you're here. And I love the fun <laughs> facts. Jalapenos. Ozark just sounds very tropical and mysterious to me for some reason. <laughs> and then to hear those fun little facts is always fun to get to know our guests. So, Alicia, we want to honor your time in this process, but we'll let's kick off with the very first first quest, question. And will you start by sharing some of your life journey with our audience today? Happy to. I'm an only child of two extraordinary, albeit delusional, parents who thought that I was just the best thing since ice cream. My parents uh, showered me with very sincere love, uh, support, my dad really was my first God echo. And daddy, ever since I was little, he would sit me down and he'd say, what's the daughter thinking? And I would tell him whatever it was, you know, depending on how old I was about my dream about the hippopotamus or my concern about, you know, water usage, disproportionate issues of justice and whatever it happened to be, I would just rattle off to my dad and he would say, oh, those are good thoughts, daughter. You've got a good thinker, daughter. The world needs to hear what you say. And so my dad especially built into me this strong sense of value that I'd been given a voice and that my voice needed to be heard. Now, my dad was an atheist. My first God echo, mm. my first accurate God echo came from my father the atheist who had himself overcome so much, uh, turned the tide in so much of what he had been handed. So my daddy love gave me this strong, strong foundation. Now it was combined with some other things though. We moved every year 
into a different place. I was always the new girl. <laughs> and even though I had this uh, deep, firm sense of being valued, I always felt out of place with everybody else. So strong nuclear support always felt awkward and clumsy in any other kind of context as the new girl. When everybody else was reading magazines about the latest boy band, I was, and this is the truth, memorizing the dictionary. I just loved dictionaries. My favorite magazine was National Geographic. I just had a little bit of a different drumbeat going on in my soul. And that combination of strong family love, but uh, strong pure rejection really shaped me in my early years and led me to a darker place where I was suicidal from the rejection. Even parent love couldn't anchor me from that. And those years uh, are really when my decision to be an atheist, which came very, very early in life, it was during those darker years where my atheism started gathering some anger around the edges. And I started becoming more of a debating, arguing, adamant atheist against anyone, whether it was a Hindu or a Christian, anybody who had the audacity to believe in the existence of a God or gods that held all power. But when I took a realistic look around the world, it sure didn't seem as though he or she or they were using the power to prevent pain. Mm -hmm. And that was my beginning, those early, early years of formation. Wow. That is uh, amazing to hear just parts of your journey. And Alicia, if I'm right, you and your husband, Barry, have some roots in college and young adult ministry. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And can you yes. talk about that? Yes. Well, Jesus interrupted my atheistic existence just weeks before I was beginning my pre-law studies at the University of Texas in Austin. And so my Jesus formation occurred in college in the secular university with a tremendous group that was just beginning. It was called Chi Alpha. And the campus minister there committed herself to meet with me for four and a half years. And her focus was the word. Mm. I mean, this woman, she loved the word. <laughs> she she loved was, words, so that's good. <laughs> yes, I know, right? What, what was so amazing to me is when I was an atheist, Christians just felt compelled to give me Bibles. I mean, they just could not help themselves. But for me, the words were thinner than the paper they were written on. I would just keep tossing the gifts aside, you know, saying what nonsense. But when Jesus interrupted my life, all I wanted was a Bible. And when I opened it up, it was no longer a book. It was a voice. And I just began devouring the voice. And so this woman comes along as my campus pastor and teaches me to do word studies and character studies and thematic studies and book studies and exhaustive studies. And she anchored my extraordinary salvation encounter with the eternal word of God. And I got a degree along the way, but I was there to be mentored by a campus ministry. And then my husband and I, when I returned, I was overseas for a couple of years doing missions. When I returned and he and I got married, we continued in campus ministry for quite some time. I love that. <laughs> That's really fun to hear. I didn't know all of it, but what I did know is my wife and I, we were on staff at a church doing young adult ministry here in Minnesota. And one of our good friends, before we started a Chi Alpha here in, in Bloomington, Minnesota, one of our good friends is at University of North Dakota. His name's Mike Mislinski. He actually wrote the, the intro and outro song to this podcast. And he themed some of his EP, his latest music release, based on your, some of your book. And just the desert, the oasis, and feel alive. And so anyway, all that to say, Ms. Beats, as we call him, he's up at UND and he's met your husband and told me that, hey, like, UND Chi Alpha exists because of the, the answered prayers mm -hmm. of the choice. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of cool to, to see uh, that part of our, our stories have some similarity in it. I think that's yes. a beautiful approach to, to ministry, to, to believe in you at such a young age. Is that I'm committing to four and a half years of, of mm -hmm. my life and your life if you're willing to do it. And we know yes. that seasons can come and go and the season of being on college campuses is significant. The seasons of how we step out of those roles is very significant. And you talk about seasons a lot um, 
in your books. That's a theme throughout. And we see in the world around us. I mean, we live in Minnesota, so we see winter, spring, summer, and fall. Four distinct Four. seasons. And yeah. let me just tell you, the, the boots came out today because fall officially started, I believe it was just Monday, and the high is like 62. So my, oh, wow. car, my boots and my skinny jeans are happy, but... <laughs> But uh, Alicia, we, we recognize that many leaders, probably in the month of January of a new year and a new decade, they're coming out of transition. Maybe you're there in the midst of transition, or they will be going into some form of transition. What would you say to young adult leaders about life's many seasons? Mm -hmm. Yes. How much time do we have? The as much as you need, my friend. <laughs> So Psalm 74, verse 17, Psalm of Asaph, he says, and he's speaking of God, you made both summer and winter. And I think that's our starting point. When we think about seasons in the natural, we know that it is some combination. <laughs> my, my background is liberal arts, so I'm not going to wax too sciencey here right now, but <laughs> uh, the, the earth tilting on its axis and rotating around the sun. In other words, we know that the seasons are completely out of our control. Yep. There's nothing we can do to speed them up. There's nothing we can do to hasten them. There's nothing we can do to dismiss them. They are, are, they are here. Right. And, but when it comes to our spiritual seasons, for some reason, we tend to think that we ought to have control over our seasons, that we ought to be able to rush through some more quickly and bring others to us faster. And specifically, the seasons we always want are the ones that are visibly fruitful. So depending on where you live, it could be summer, it could be fall. But that's where we want to camp. We just want to set up our tent and call that place home. But continuous increase is exhausting. Continuous increase is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So this philosophy we have that we somehow need to always be increasing in countable productivity mm -hmm. is a form of self-sabotage. Wow. Not only does it not give the next generation something they can live into, it's not something we can live for long. I was once a long time ago, long time ago, I was in one of those meetings that people should never invite Alicia into. It was one of those <laughs> national think tanks about fruitfulness and the heart of it was just beautiful. And I was pretty quiet most of the time. And so finally somebody said, Alicia, what do you think we need to do? to increase our productivity. And I said, redefine it. What if we were to give leaders across the nation permission to have a different kind of productivity, the kind of productivity that's called pruning instead wow. of counting? And what if we were to give everybody the opportunity to not fill out those lovely reports for a year or two or three or five and to have a different type of growth? Because if we don't give ourselves permission, we rarely give each other permission and then you have the quote unquote growth of the church on the backs of ministerial exhaustion. It's just simply not sustainable. Right. So God brings these seasons for our benefit. Winter is for our benefit. Summer is for our benefit, but we need to listen to the sound of the season and trust the season maker. That's incredible. Uh, <laughs> listen to the sound of the season and trust the season maker and Alicia, I think that brings us into soul care. And this is a newer concept for me. I had some transition a year ago where I was on staff at a church that I had grown up in for seven years. I was the young adult pastor there and then jumped into full-time campus ministry with Micah. And it, during that time, um, Pastor Jerry Strandquist, who I had started in ministry under, had retired. And he had given some of us young leaders like access to his whole library. And one of the books he gave me was called Anonymous. It was written by you and it was even a signed copy. Mm -hmm. And that was when I kind of understood the word soul care. It was a foreign concept to me, but how can young leaders especially find new seasons or new rhythms of life and leadership and begin to care for their, for their own soul? Mm -hmm. I have a couple of thoughts towards that. And I'm a bit of an artist at heart, so I'm going to talk in circles, if that's all right with y'all. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so 3 John, verse 2. Let me read that for it. Pull that out for our time together. John says, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul 
is getting along well. So that word in the Greek for soul is suke or psyche. And the two phrases that it may go well and get along well are exactly the same words about your life and about your soul. So I want us to just set that down as a foundation stone. John, this extraordinary apostle, once called the son of thunder, now known as the apostle of love, says, I want your soul to be well. So what does a well soul look like? How does a well soul form? A couple of years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference where their theme was a healthy leader. And my specific assignment was a healthy soul. Oh my word, it was so much fun to study for this one. And I realized that when I started doing the study, both the biblical and historical, you know, the etymology, and then also just the, the words that have been used to translate um, as healthy and soul, it captured so much of my heart for ministry and ministers and leaders in general. I want to read to you one of the things that I found in that study. It was the very, very first time the word healthy appears in the English language. Now, some translations uh, talk about may your soul be healthy or may your soul prosper is probably the one that we're more familiar with. The very first time the word healthy appears in the English language, it appeared in a Christmas Day sermon from a Benedictine monk and abbot named Alfred of Einsham. And I want to read this. I tracked it down. It's the year 1000. And this is what he says. The Son of God was crowded in his inn that he might give us a spacious dwelling in the kingdom of heaven if we obey his will. He asks nothing of us as reward for his toil except our soul's health that we may prepare ourselves for him pure and uncorrupted in bliss and everlasting joy. So this ancient mentor says two things of interest. First, that God really does want a reward for everything he's done, which is not something we think about much. And secondly, what that reward is, is not just our soul. He sourced that, right? He breathed our soul into existence. What he wants is for our soul to be healthy. Have we ever thought that a healthy soul could actually be a gift, a reward to our God? Have we ever thought that a healthy soul is something other than a spiritualized form of narcissism? Mm -hmm. And this is really an expression of gratitude. It's an expression of thanksgiving. It's an expression of honor to attend to the health of our soul. If you two were to give two cars to two families, Let's say you've had the ability to do such a thing and you gave it to them. It was a gift. And then a couple of months later, you went to visit them. You just showed up, wanted to say, Hey, and as you were walking in, you happened to walk by the car. So let's say Joe had car number one and uh, Joe's car, man. I mean, of course, somebody had been riding it for three months, but he'd been taking care of it. You could tell, you know, he kept the air up in the tires. It was fairly clean. You could tell he'd been maintaining it. You just walk by. The next couple, couple hours later, you go, you visit Ralph. Ralph's the second guy who got a car. And Ralph has had a rough time with his car. I mean, it's a mess. It's, been, it's got dings. It's been trashed. I'm not talking about Cheerios in the carpet. We've all got that. But I mean, it has just been trashed. Now, the gift is irrevocable, right? Mm. You're not going to recall the gift at all. Right. Without them saying a word, who would you naturally feel more gratitude from? Joe, Joe. for sure. Joe. Okay, so God has gifted you with a soul. How are you taking care of it? How are you attending to it? Are we being proactive toward it? Are we watering it? Are we feeding it? Or are we trashing it or neglecting it? And so Alfred of Einstein says that our soul's health is the reward that God wants. And just in case anybody's confused, you know, of his listeners on that Christmas Day sermon, he goes on to talk about what he means by a healthy soul. And he talks about a healthy soul is one that prepares itself for Jesus. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Do we all move to Jerusalem? You know, do we become monks on mountains? What on earth do we do? Well, how do we prepare ourselves for Jesus? Well, we have minds that think with him. We have emotions that are occupied by him. We have wills that acknowledge his residency. We have beings that know that one day mysteriously we're going to be a part of his bride. 
we live with God in every single moment. So back to your point, how do we begin to cultivate a healthy soul? How do we grow a healthy soul? How do we do soul care? I think our very first step is asking God to mentor our minds. We think with him. Don't just plan, plan with him. Let him lead the planning. Don't just think about what you're going to do this weekend. Ask him, what shall we do together this weekend? How are we going to spend this free time? Uh, you know, which, uh, do you want to, my daughter and I have been watching Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Jesus watches with us. <laughs> we need to ask God to mentor our minds. And if we let him lead in our minds and us follow, we are going to be making some different choices that will accumulate, gain weight, and have enormous bearing on our futures and our legacies. I think that's it's a beautiful picture of just allowing God. I just think of the verse, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so mm -hmm. that you can understand God's good, perfect, and pleasing will. And yes. in, in, in not just into our souls, but inviting him into our mind, our situations, our mm -hmm. circumstances, our weekends, our plans. And I just get the vision of just sitting in a vehicle. How many times have I as a leader or I as an individual been in the driver's seat asking God, where are we going to go? And when he picks me up and moves me to the passenger seat and says, buckle up, I'm the driver, you know? So I think that that's kind of just the illustration that I get in my mind of how many times have I been in the driver's seat on all those different occasions from my mind, my soul, the health of my soul, thinking that I, I know best and I know how to take care of that. So that kind of just leads in leads into the the book I believe anonymous is where you had started talking about this, and I think sometimes when I find myself in the driver's seat when I should be in the passenger seat, maybe feel like oh I'm a failure once again, you know, or what? How did I get here? How did I squeeze over and you know push him out the window maybe at times? But you describe failure as a hidden friend, mm -hmm. and can you describe to the listener today what do you mean by failure can be or is a hidden friend? Yes. Well, when we think about failure, there really are at least two different types of failure. There's the failure that Jesus died for, and there's the failure that he didn't. Mm. And we have a tendency to think that all failure is the type that he died for. So if I could, I'll give a little illustration yeah. of back when I was in college. <laughs> so, as a brand new follower of Jesus, you know, I didn't know whether there was more to be found in the book of John, James, or Jerry. I just knew that. <laughs> and I had so much zeal. I mean, I, as, as adamantly as I was an atheist, you know, to discover that God lives and he loves you and he wants to be with you. Oh my goodness, it, it changed everything. But my campus ministers had me sit down for years because my giftings outweighed my character. Mm -hmm. God breathes these giftings into us at birth. And they needed some of those giftings, but I didn't have enough character to sustain the giftings. So they had me sit down, which was a, a gift beyond price. Um, such a gift. I was so frustrated at the time though. I was just annoyed. Anyway, so I get to my senior year and they finally let me stand up and do something. And so I tell them, oh, this amazing idea that I have had. Oh, it's I mean, this is it. This, this is going to change our campus. I tell them that we are going to have, now be merciful because this is a while ago. I said, we are going to have an evangelistic aerobics outreach. And my campus pastor said, go on. I said, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to have this incredible, uh, we're going to find a, a fitness place that we can be. I'm going to pick great music. We're going to have a stunning workout. And then afterwards, after everybody's done, we're going to ask if anybody has any prayer requests. And then we can follow up one-on-one -on -one afterwards. And it's just, it's going to change everything. And so he told, the same, told me the same thing he was going to tell me more times than I can count. He said, Alicia, that's an idea. Without question, that's an idea. Didn't say it was a good one or bad one. It was an idea. He said, you go do that. So I did. Oh my, I worked so hard. I advertised. I got the workout together. The day came, it was going to be a six week class. The day came, but nobody else did. Mm. Nobody ever, I mean ever, except for me, showed up for this fitness outreach. No one, not a soul. Mm -hmm. So was my fitness outreach a failure? Yes. Yes, it was. A dismal failure, a big one, clear. 
Second question, though, did Jesus die on the cross to forgive me for planning and holding and implementing that outreach? No, because not all failure is sin. That's good. I never heard that before in my life. It's a good distinction. I think that's a clarifying, freeing distinction. Yes. It's, It's one that we need because we spend so much emotional energy either embarrassed or despairing about failures that Jesus didn't die for. I even do this as a parent. You know, something will happen at school or, and I'll say, okay, I know that that was frustrating and I'm sure you're a little embarrassed. Do you think Jesus was thinking about that one on the cross? And the kids have to respond with yes or no. I'm like, okay, then it's, it's, that doesn't mean it wasn't real. That doesn't mean it doesn't sting, but we need to keep it above the line. We cannot treat all failure as though Jesus died on the cross for it. Failure is one of the wisest teachers if we ever let her speak. So we have the kind of failure that Jesus didn't die for. It's a friend, for sure, a wise teacher. Yeah. And I, honestly, I think one of the greatest things I learned in that is that my leader let me do it, knowing it was going to be a flop. He didn't hinder me from doing it because he was afraid of how it would reflect his organization or how not having something successful would what that would say about him as my leader he let me try and he let me fail and he let me see that i could survive it but i also say that failure that jesus did die for is also a friend because it reveals what's already there Mm -hmm. i think that oh goodness it must have been 2005 i had this crazy crazy high fever and i had to go into the er and come to find out there were these masses in my stomach that they thought were cancerous. And it, within 48 hours, I was uh, under the knife in a huge surgery. Thankfully, nothing was cancerous at that time, but they removed it before it became cancerous. Mm-hmm. Well, the fever didn't cause those masses. They were the symptom of the masses. Right. And that's what sin-induced failure is. It's a symptom of the sin. And so, thank God, it's discovered, uncovered, revealed, so it can be repented of, and I can move on. So failure on either count, it can be a friend, if we have ears to hear what it's teaching us. That's so good. <laughs> I love that, and, and I remember reading that in Anonymous, and just having never heard that before, Alicia, I found such freedom. Mm-hmm. Failure's not final, mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't define who I am, and Honestly, like there's a freedom that comes from recognizing that failure is okay and we'll fail forward. And um, you also write in that same book that Jesus' own life on earth was a great model of balancing a private and public life. And this is I think, particularly important for ministry leaders in visible positions of congregations or campuses because there is the fact that we are known and that doesn't, it's, it's neither good nor bad, but this balance of a public and private life, will you talk about anonymity and obscurity and the balance that Jesus modeled of um, anonymousness? Yes. Yes. When we think of balance, we think of 50, 50, right? But the model of balance that Jesus reveals to us in his life isn't 50-50. It's more like 90-10. His first 30 years were hidden, underestimated, unapplauded, mostly undocumented. Last 10% was visible. Even that is not entirely recorded. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, what is, is it John that says that if everything he had done were recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to hold everything. Wow. And so even in the the 10%, even in the three-ish visible years, there's still so much that was quiet and undocumented. When we think of public and private, we don't even go 50-50. We try to inverse those things. And we somehow try to sustain a 90% visible life through 10% of hiddenness. It's just simply not the model that Jesus gave to us. There's these formative periods of hiddenness And even while he was in his visible years, they're always having to search for him as he's running off, you know, to find quiet places to pray, quiet places to be, quiet places to listen. We see him doing it not only early in the morning, but we see him doing it in times of grief, Mm -hmm. uh, in times of great decision-making. 
And then there's this hidden conversation that he's always having the father that every once in a while becomes visible when he says things like, you know, I, I, I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this for their benefit. This stunning hiddenness that was sacred to Jesus. And we really have to reconfigure our thoughts to embrace that. And it's not just because of social media. Again, I think social media is just the symptom of our philosophy uh, that the more visible, the more valuable. Wow. We go back to nature. Life commences in the dark warmth of a womb. Mm. God conceals from our curiosity his most mysterious act of creation. Does unseen mean unimportant? Absolutely not. Those hidden months are formative. And when they're prematurely interrupted, the results can be disastrous. We think about the garden. My husband's a gardener. Before he can enjoy a plant's fruit, he has to tenderly and strategically attend to its root. So a plant's birth begins with its burial. We commit an unremarkable seed to the silence of the soil, and there it sits, unapplauded, unseen, and everything in its future rests on its ability to send out roots in hidden places, to send out roots in unapplauded, unseen, hidden places, and then reach for the sun. And yet, when we think about our own lives, it's like we want to turn that plant upside down. It can't survive, let alone thrive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that you wrote, I believe in the sacred slow, just slowing down in life, soul care, rest, decrease, all those different words that kind of come into play. And I just love that illustration that you gave about the plant. Like that is, it needs to it needs to be buried before it can grow. It needs to, like, we need to die to self before we can grow in Jesus and like Jesus. And I know we have a lot of different listeners listening who are leaders to different capacities. And we live in a culture where it's bigger, better, faster, stronger. And that's kind of the anthem through social media. Instead of lying back in that season where we feel like we're lying dormant, but God is moving the most in us. We want to constantly post and we want to be in the front lines and we want maybe that main stage or maybe that's a constant, you know, wrestling for a lot of leaders, um, especially younger leaders, because they desire so many big things. Um, so how can leaders develop the discipline in their lives of slowing down when everything in the culture that we're looking at talking about is saying bigger, faster, stronger is better? Yes. I think there are several different practices that we might find fruitful for a season, but I'm going to loop back to one that I think can help us for a lifetime. And that is letting God mentor your mind. Mm -hmm. We call it life in the plural in the sacred slow. Brother Lawrence called it practicing the presence. Yeah. It means that we live out in our minds, the theological reality of Emmanuel, God with us. We're not alone. We're never alone. I'm not doing this podcast. Jesus and I are doing this podcast. Right. I didn't brush my teeth. Jesus and I brushed my teeth. I'm not ignoring my emails. Jesus and I are ignoring my emails. I, there is this Jesus and me are doing everything from cleaning the toilet to preparing a sermon. And when, since God is infinite and since he's omnipresent, that means he's equally present in every moment. Good. That means we do not have more access to God in a huge room filled with 10,000 worshipers than we do quietly walking along the woods. We have the same access to God, which means every single moment is equally full of potential to know him. And we don't really believe that. We think that some moments are lesser. That's why we treat some moments and some seasons like stepping stones to something we perceive to be greater. But if God is in this moment, what can make it greater? Good. So we begin to rethink of with him. And to me, that one practice, that one practice can change everything because it changes our self-talk. Mm. It changes how we interact with other people. It changes how we view time because it's his gift. It's not a Grinch and I'm living it with him. I wake up in the morning and it's, it's just so, it's a simple, simple practice. Good morning, Jesus. What's on your heart for today? Oh, we forgot to get milk yesterday. That's on you. You've got a better memory than I do. 
<laughs> but we've got to fill out that form so that the kids can go on that retreat. Oh, that's right. Oh, and today we're also going to look over those applications. Okay, so what do you want to do? Do you want to walk first or do you want to go down and get breakfast first? Now, do I expect to hear a voice? No. Do I expect to see writing on my wall? No. But what am I doing? I am theologically lined up with reality. I am not alone. Faith is a duet. Why do we live it like a solo? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And it's just in capturing my thoughts a thousand times today that I'm building the muscle to willfully be present to God's presence. And that is the one encouragement I would give. There's some beautiful books, Practicing the Presence of God, The Practice of the Presence of God. I prefer the companion edition with Brother Lawrence and Frank Laubach. Brother Lawrence was a monk in a monastery peeling potatoes, which is amazing. Frank Laubach was a minister surrounded by people. And so his life more closely reflects my own circumstances. And yet he practiced the presence of God in the little things and the big things. There is so many amazing takeaways already in this episode, because um, I, I love what you said that unseen does not mean unimportant to be unknown, undiscovered, misunderstood. We're in good company because Jesus had those hidden years too. And yes. I think you're, even the pace of this podcast episode is soothing. Yeah. And I pray that people who maybe are going through a heavy season, mm -hmm. that the presence of Jesus would, you'd recognize and you'd let God mentor your mind in Alicia's words to, to allow you to be, have your eyes open to know God better, mm -hmm. to see the hope to which he's called you. And Alicia, you write something that just came, popped into my head while you were talking. It's not on our like script, but you, you write, how do I stay silent when these massive dreams are inside of, of me? And that's something that stood out to me that I just wanted to ask you about and I forgot to write it in the show notes. But can you, can you answer that question of how have you found, like you have these massive God dreams that are birthed inside of you, but how do you let him promote them? How do you let him take lead on those? Mm -hmm. There is a very practical method that I share with the, those that I mentor. And for lack of a better phrase, I call it peripheral vision prayer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you think about peripheral vision, right? It's when something is just far enough to the side where you catch a glimpse of it. Uh, now, if you put it fully in front of you, let me call that hyper-focus or obsession. Wow. Let's say you put it fully behind you, I'd call that denial. Sure. But there is this position of peripheral prayer. And this is a practice that it began in my life as a senior. Every Friday, I would go to the chapel and I would just sit in God's presence and listen. And I would take those huge dreams and I would put them in my peripheral vision. I wouldn't set them right in front of me because I want to see Jesus. I don't want to hyper-focus on the dreams. I wouldn't set them behind me because I'm not going to deny them. I'm not going to act like they don't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put them in my peripheral vision in prayer, and I'm going to focus on Jesus. And so I would walk in every Friday and say, Lord, holding these dreams in my hands, put them in, putting them even physically to the side, say, you know, help me see you. Mm -hmm. you know, help me love you. You know, help me know you. Because if we trust him, he, he's going to take care of these things. He's going to water them. He's going to elevate them or he's going to bury them. Whatever he needs to do to make sure they are fruitful in a way that won't sabotage our soul. We've got these huge dreams but Jesus isn't going, he does not want you to achieve them at the price of your own soul, yeah. which means sometimes we hear his not yet. And sometimes we water dreams for the next generation. That's good. Peripheral vision prayer has been a, a practice for me. I think that's great. And this is one question that kind of popped into my head last night, just really mm -hmm. wanting to dig into... Um, you know, your perspective of this. And for whatever reason, I mean, growing up, I always thought the words sabbatical 
was a, a negative, a negative thing. Oh, that there's something personally going on in this pastor's life that they're wrestling with that they don't want to expose to the church. Oh, they're having family problems in this area, or I have no idea where that came from in my life or why I always thought sabbatical was this negative term. Um, but we know that rest is obviously important. So what would you share? Why is sabbatical a sabbatical so important for a pastor, a lead pastor, whatever their capacity is. Um, yeah, I would just love to hear that. Why, why do some people view that as something negative or bad? Yes. Well, the concept of a sabbatical year is embedded in the Old Testament. Every seventh year was to be a Sabbath year mm -hmm. where the land rested, where we heard the word in community, where we released slaves and we canceled debts. So that'll preach for a couple of months. Yes. Oh, yeah. We bless sure. the land. We hear the word in community. We release slaves. We cancel debts. So God built it into the rhythm of his people, though historically it was not honored. Uh, but built in this rhythm of almost reset, mm. rest and reset. Yeah. And I've often thought about this, even the last several years, as I've been walking with pastors who would love to take a sabbatical, but their cultural framework tells them that it either means one of two things. They're either lazy or they're broken. Right. And I think that we are just going to have to have a generation to take the risk of being misunderstood in order to reclaim and recapture the biblical meaning of sabbatical. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. Instead of lazy and what's the other word? Broken, too broken. Wow. Yeah, that's how I always viewed wow. it, lazy or broken, probably more broken. But now I just want to view it as rested with a healthy soul, like a soul that's filled with Yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that's, great. that's such a good concept to build on. And, and Alicia, John the Baptist has this prayer that mm -hmm. I have found that I often like to pray and just declare over my life. God, would you become greater? I must become less. And in, in your book, 40 Days of Decrease, there's 40 days or 40 weeks or kind of 40 journeys mm -hmm. that a leader could go on to decrease. And I know like one of them that I'd never tried was like fasting light for a day, uh -huh. fasting my phone for a day, fasting my voice for a day. And some of them were like hard <laughs> because it was, it was just uncomfortable. It was new for me. And it was, it was fun to experience God in that journey. But what are some ways that you've seen leaders take steps to become more like Christ through decreasing? Yes. I think that John the Baptist really does give us some uh, really beautiful examples and that still apply to us, you know, in the 21st century. Yeah. I yeah. think that one of the things that John the Baptist modeled that we have to model in this him becoming, Jesus becoming greater and us becoming less, is not adopting other people's expectations of us. Mm -hmm. there's a line isn't there between people when they're encouraging us and we feel that it, it amplifies our God consciousness but then there's a line that we cross where people have expectations for us maybe even big dreams for us yeah. and it feels a little different doesn't it right it almost amplifies our self-consciousness and that's not helpful that's exhausting. I found out that some of the reason over the decades in ministry that I've had trouble saying no is people would have these massive and affirming expectations for me. And I suddenly would adopt them and inherit them and feel like it was my responsibility to bring them to pass. No. Their expectations are their expectations. Right. So I'll receive the affirmation. I'll be encouraged by the encouragement. But I do not have to inherit other people's expectations of where, quote unquote, my ministry is going. And I see that John the Baptist did that. People had all, they, they wanted him to be the Messiah. He said, no, that's not, not what I'm called to do. Wow. They would have been so pleased with him if he said, oh yeah, I, I can step into that. But that wasn't where he was led. That wasn't his calling. So I think not adopting other people's expectations, saying thank you for the encouragement, but not inheriting 
are feeling like we now are responsible for expectations of us that other people have created. And you know, I'm not talking about morality or integrity. I'm right. talking about the bigger, better beyond. Right, 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 right. exactly. People have for us. And one of the other things I see in John the Baptist's life is he called the desert his friend. Mm. He lives there. Well, the desert is not what we call our friend. <laughs> Those lonely, unseen, unapplauded places, it gets us right back into a lot of the themes in Anonymous. Um, I also think that John the Baptist was faithful in the seemingly small. He, I don't think most people would have picked um, his profession <laughs> to be lived out in the desert. He did, the people came to him, which is a, very interesting. I mean, he was faithful where God planted him. And yeah. And God brought the people in God's time. God brought the people to him in God's time. I also think that one of the things John the Baptist modeled is that he passed on opportunities to others. He very clearly turned to his disciples, said, look, there's Jesus. There's the Lamb of God. In other words, cue, go follow him. Mm -hmm. And as we pass, uh, pass opportunities on to others, not everything that we are given is for us to own. A lot of it is for us to steward and give on to others. And then I think also just as what we were talking about before, that uh, principle of guarding Sabbath, of realizing that decrease for the love of God is holy. That's so good. And the thing that I felt like God spoke to me during my times studying your books, Alicia, is that I've realized more and more that I've begun to care less and less about what people think and say about me. And there's such freedom that comes from that in not, not living just for the expectations or the applause or the approval of others. And I just can't tell you how, how much freedom I've found from that. And I pray that same spirit of freedom over people listening that maybe are worried or stressed or anxious over the expectations that others have for them or just maybe that they have adopted for themselves and just to realize like, hey, I'm cool with Jesus and a few close friends knowing the 90% of me. Mm -hmm. I'm cool with Jesus and a few close friends knowing who I really am and what other people outside of that inner life, that inner circle, that inner well, what they choose to say or think or believe. Hey, that's cool. That's up to them. I've made peace that I'm going to, forgive them in advance, or I'm just not going to care or check the, check the chatter, so to speak. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, thanks for just investing in us as leaders, yeah. Micah and I, and um, your book, and also the Young Adult Stop Today show. But we have a final portion of our, of our episode today of mm -hmm. final thoughts, five in five, five questions, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to dive into some fun with this. Are you up for that? I'm ready. She's ready. All right. Question one. Um, what has surprised you about college students and young adults regarding the next generation? I don't know if it's a surprise as much as it is uh, genuine joy. And that's that they continue their currency is authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think everything seems to be working against that, but their currency remains authenticity. And that gives me great hope. That's good. I found that to be true. So what would be maybe a favorite event that you've done or participated or even led in ministry? Yes, I think my favorite, especially in the last maybe five years, was a wonderful uh, gathering of 30 bishops who asked me to do their spiritual formation two-day retreat. Oh my goodness. Well, the combination in the room of head, heart, and art of these extraordinary souls, it was it was. Amazing. I felt like I had wings. I could have stayed there for days. Was, <laughs> oh, that's a great opportunity. Yeah, right. room full of leaders. I loved it. Yes. Okay. Third question is, what is your favorite story of life change? I think it would be my children and some of the challenges they faced when they were born, some of the early diagnoses, and to see them where they are today is have a front row. And that is incredible. Beautiful. I'd imagine that's a tremendous joy and mm -hmm. almost a glimpse. What I hear you say is just like this glimpse into the father's heart, God's heart, mm -hmm. where he adopted us as his children. And 
I, I just think that's a powerful theme that, that you can relate to on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And so would you be willing to tell us maybe one of the epic failures or hidden friends you've experienced in life or ministry? Yes, the, I think the most painful one was I, I've been doing this for a couple of decades in three different countries. And there was one situation where I hit a wall with uh, ministry. And I, up until that time, really thought that vision was enough. Mm. That passion for the Lord and clarity and vision could get me through any situation. But I hit a wall with the circumstances that I was ministering in, tried to scale it and couldn't, and realized it's, my soul was starting to become vulnerable to toxicity in the environment. And so I had to walk away from what I thought I was going to be doing for the rest of my life for the safety of my own soul. And I remember being so disillusioned. I sat down with one of my mentors and I said, did I miss it? Was I not supposed to be here? What on earth is going on? And they said something very wise. They said, they'd like to suggest that I hadn't missed anything, but that God had cornered me to consider something I would have never considered otherwise. And in the years that followed, I think that that was absolutely not just wise, but accurate. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure many leaders listening or pastors listening can relate to that form of the story, saying that I've reached, a, I've hit a wall, I, I can't scale this on my own, vision isn't enough. Mm. And if you could tell a group of young um, adult pastors or college pastors in ministry one thing, what would you leave them with today? The one thing I think I probably already shared, so this will be a close to the one. The one would be, let Jesus mention your mind. Think with him. Live it as a duet. Great challenge. <laughs> Here's another thing, though. I think that our, and I mean generation in a broad sense, I think that we have come to think that the height of Christian maturity is service. And you see this in how we play things out. And this is, these are good and valuable things. People come to Jesus. We put them in Christianity 101. We help them discover their gifts. We find a place of service for them. They start serving. We put them in leadership. And once they're there, we call it safe. Now, all of that is good. None of that needs to go by the wayside. But I'm not sure that service is the height of Christian maturity biblically. I think the height of Christian maturity biblically is love. Love for God love for others, and love for yourself. Yeah. And by, again, I don't mean spiritualized narcissism. I mean agreeing with God about what he says about who you are and what he's done for you. And that, that creates a different trajectory of mission, mission and vision. When we stop thinking of service as the end goal and we keep love as the height of maturity. So I would offer that as something to consider next time we're in a planning meeting. Amazing, and what you just said, Alicia, I just wanna hit home one other angle. And last night we had a group of college students over in our home, and it was so fun. We had one of them bring his guitar and sing in worship, and we chose the song that has seven words, I am who you say I am. Mm -hmm. And just partner agreeing, like I'm not in love with myself, I'm in love with Jesus and I agree like I am who he says I am and maybe that's a great after you listen to this episode go check out that worship song by Hillsong and just spend time alone with Jesus that you are his child agree with what he says about you he loves you and so therefore you love him we respond to his love with love and Dr. Alicia, thank you so much for just a great conversation today and for joining us, for kicking off season two oh, yeah. of Young Adults Not Today podcast and, and kicking off 2020, the year and the decade. And you as listeners can find out more about Dr. Alicia Briccioli, her books and her resources when you connect with us on our website at youngadults.today, as well as across social media on all platforms is at Young Adults. Dot today. So until next time, this is Josiah and Micah Keneally signing off at Young Adults Today with Dr. Alicia Britt Choli.